All right, moving on. Situn min shu'ab al-iman, huquq al-awlad wal ahlin. The rights of the children and the family. Uh, and this consists of a man looking after his children, teaching them about their religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Nara wa quduha nas wal hijara. Alayha malaikatun ghilabun shidadun la ya'asun Allah ma amrahum wa yafa'aluna ma yu'maru. All you who believe, protect yourselves. And your families from a fire whose fuel is people and stones. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first orders us, protect yourselves first and foremost. And then also your family. Don't forget about your family. What does it mean to protect yourselves and your family? Uh, it's mentioned uh, that Al-Hasan al-Basri says that command them to obey Allah. Command them to obey Allah and teach them goodness. And it's reported that Ali radiallahu anh said, teach them and discipline them. Teach them and discipline them. This is how to protect them from the fire. Teach them their religion, first and foremost. Then we had their narration in Sahih Muslim. Anas ibn Malik narrates, whoever supports two little girls until they come of age will be on the Day of Judgment as close to me as this. And he brought his two fingers together. His two fingers together. Uh, so this is specifically for girls. Uh, the hadith specifically singles out girls because at that time, girl children were considered to be um, something not desired. It was not desirable to have girl children. And we know that uh, some of the Arabs, not all of them, but some of them would go to the length of even uh, burying their girl children alive. When on the day of judgment, the girl who's, been, who's buried alive, she will be asked, with, with what sin were you killed? Why were you killed? So this was looked down upon girls. So Rasulullah encouraged uh, not only uh, taking pride in having girls, but he placed this reward of whoever raises two girls together. Uh, and they come of age and they have good training upbringing, upbringing then they will be very close to Rasulullah on the day of judgment. Al-Hadi wa Sittun in Shu'ab al-Iman muqarabatu ahli al-Deen wa mawaddatihim wa isha'i salam baynahum wal musafaha lahum Keeping in the company of pious, loving them, greeting them and shaking their hands and doing any other thing which would strengthen one's affection for them. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not enter houses other than your own houses until you are certain welcome and greet their inhabitants. No one should enter somebody else's house unless, they have, uh, and they're, unless they're welcome. You don't just barge into somebody's house. You have to seek permission. And th there's a whole set of rules, fiqh rules of how to enter somebody's house, how to seek permission. Uh, we'll discuss that at a later time. And the hadith of Abu Hurairah by him, In whose hand is my soul, you shall not enter Jannah until you have Iman, and you will not have Iman until you love one another. Shall I tell you of something which, were you to do it, would cause you to love one another? It is to greet the people you meet with salam. Right, this is the, the number one way to earn brotherhood and sisterhood, is spreading the salam. Something very simple. Very simple, but very powerful. Spreading salam. Saying salam when you see somebody. This is, especially, uh, we do it in the masjid, but even, uh, especially on the street, when you see your fellow Muslim brother or sister on the street, spreading the salam, this is something that will cause the hearts to come together. And he did not mention the hadith of uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, but I'll mention it here. That Abdullah ibn Salam, he was a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, and he became Muslim, right? He accepted Islam, and he was a rabbi. He was very knowledgeable in the Jewish scriptures. So he says that uh, before Rasulullah came to Medina, everyone was talking about him, and it was, a, it was a talk of the town. Everybody was saying Rasulullah is coming, he's coming, he's coming. And you, we know that they would go out every single day to see when he's coming. And then they would go back when they didn't see him coming. So they were, the, the city of Medina was extremely excited at the, at the coming of Rasulullah And Anas ibn Malik, he says that, I witnessed two days in Medina. The, the happiest day was when Rasulullah came. And the saddest day was when he left and when he passed away and he departed this world. So Abdullah bin Salam, he says that, People were talking all the time about Rasulullah is coming, he's coming, he's coming. And at this time, he's not a Muslim, right? He's not a Muslim. And Rasulullah comes and he goes and he wants to see who is this man that they are talking about who's claiming to be a prophet. And he says that when I saw him, I said to myself, this is not the face of a liar. This is not the face of a liar. This man cannot be a liar just by looking at his face. And he says, the very first thing I heard, the very first thing that I heard Rasulullah say, Ayyuhan nas afshu salam. Oh, oh people, spread the salam amongst each other, feed the people, and pray at night when people are sleeping. Pray at night when people are sleeping. Oh people, spread the salam 
right? Afshu salam wa atu'im al-ta'am. And another version mentions wasilu al-arham and maintain the ties of kinship. Wasallu bil layl wa nasu niyam and and pray at night when people are sleeping. Tadkhul al-jannah bi salam. You will enter into paradise with salam. So he said this is the very first thing I heard, and we see that this is how our Sultan brought the people together. We know that the brotherhood between the Ansar and the Muhajirun, nothing like it in history. The, brother that, the brotherhood that they had. To the point where a person was willing to divorce his wife. One of his wives. He had two wives. One of them, companions had two wives. He was willing to divorce his wife and say, you take this one of them and I'll keep the other. You take half of my wealth, I'll take the other half. This is the love of brotherhood they, that they had between each other. And, uh, and Rasulullah paired them together as, as a brotherhood. And no other brotherhood in the history of mankind has achieved that. And this is how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, initiated his brotherhood by spreading the salam. Very first thing he said, spread the salam. So this is one way in which we can increase brotherhood and sisterhood uh, between us. Also we have the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. I once asked Anas al Malik whether the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu used to shake each other's hand. And he applied in the affirmative. On another sunnah. Another sunnah to shake, shake people's hands. Right? This is also something that will increase uh, love and harmony between the Muslims. Uh, and we had the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu who says on the day of Qiyamah Allah shall declare where are those who loved one another for my sake so that I may shade them under my throne on a day when there is or where they will, when there will be no shade except for my shade two people who love each other for the sake of Allah this is one of uh, the seven categories of people mentioned who will earn Allah's shade under his throne on a day when there is no shade الثاني والستون من شعب الإيمان رد السلام. This also continues on from the previous branch, which we mentioned. One of the best ways to increase the brotherhood and love is to spread the salam, and it's, uh, and so as a result of that, responding to the salam is also extremely important. And we know that re- returning the salam is wajib, right? This is mandatory. Initiating the salam is recommended, right? It is not mandatory to initiate the salam. But if somebody gives you salam, you have to respond. This is wajib for you to respond. رَدُّ السَّلَامِ لِقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى وَإِذَا حُيِّيْتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّهَا And when you are greeted, greeted with a greeting, then respond with better than it or equal to it. Uh, when you greet it with a greeting, greet in return with what is better or at least the like in like manner as it was given to you. Uh, and we have the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, Abu uh, Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet said, you should not sit in the streets. And they asked, they complained, right? the companions they complained, they said, oh Rasulullah, we cannot help it, for we talk to one another, another there. So Rasulullah said, if you will not refrain, all right, then give the road its rights. They asked, what are its rights? They inquired, you reply, lower your gaze, remove obstacles, reply to the salam, enjoin good, and forbid evil, right? If you want to hang out on the streets, then these are the conditions, right? These are the conditions. If you cannot fulfill these conditions, then don't hang out on the streets. And this shows the, the mercy of Rasulullah the mercy of Islam, that we're not expected to stay in the masajid all day, right? Or stay in the house making tasbih and dhikr and so on. We have to socialize. But if you're gonna socialize, then you need to uh, fulfill the conditions, which is lowering the gaze, Remove obstacles, reply to the Islam, and join good uh, and forbid evil. Uh, moving on, الثالث والستون من شعب الإيمان عيادة المريد Visiting the sick, visiting the sick. This is a fard kifaya, all right, a communal obligation. If some of the community fulfill it, then it is dropped on the rest. But if nobody, if they're sick people, nobody's going to visit them, then the entire community uh, is at fault. The entire community is at fault. Visiting the sick, it is narrated in the Sahihain by Al Bara bin Azib, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi commanded us to do seven things. Seven things were commanded. Uh, now, out of these seven, uh, some of them are not mandatory, some of them are uh, recommended, and some of them are obligatory. So he commanded us to do seven things. He commanded us to visit the sick, to attend funerals, to reply to the salam of others. To say, Allah have mercy upon you when someone sneezes, to honor one's oath, to help those who are wronged, and to accept invitations. Right? To accept invitations. So out of these seven, the first one is visit the sick. What is the ruling of visiting the sick? We just said it. 
Farq kifaya, right? Uh, communal obligation. Attending funerals. Also Farq kifaya. Replying to the salam. Wajib. You have to respond. All right? You have to respond. To say Allah have mercy on you when somebody sneezes. Sunnah. Okay? Sunnah. To honor one's oath, this translation is not very accurate. Uh, what's meant here is Ibrar um, al-Qasam. This refers to when somebody asks you, uh, takes an oath for you to do something. Like if somebody says, uh, I swear by Allah that you will do this. Right? You will do this. Then it is recommended for you to fulfill that person's uh, oath. Right? So somebody swears that I swear by Allah you're going to visit me tomorrow. Right? They take an oath. For you to do something Then this is recommended for you to Help them fulfill that oath This is also sunnah uh, To help those who are wronged right? Also uh, it can, This can be a communal obligation Or it can be a sunnah as well And to accept invitations What is the ruling on accepting invitations? Anyone? Sunnah Generally speaking sunnah for the wedding invitation, some of the scholars have said that it is wajib. For the wedding invitation, specifically, the wedding invitation, some of the scholars have mentioned that this is wajib as long as it fulfills certain conditions, such as there's no uh, munkar there, there's no evil going on. Then uh, responding to the wedding invitation, specifically, many scholars have mentioned that it is wajib to respond to the wedding invitation with conditions. All right, we have the hadith about visiting the sick. Whoever visits a sick person will remain in an orchard of Jannah until he returns. Uh, and then the author of this, uh, this book, he says that, I say there's no difference whether that sick person is pious or a sinner. All right, because either way, the, that person can benefit. If he's a pious person, he can benefit. But also, even more important, if he's a sinner, then he is, he's even, even more need to be visited because then he can be reminded about... Uh, Tawbah and seeking forgiveness So this applies to both right? We don't just visit people who are righteous Or sick Even those who are not righteous They should also be visited Because this is an opportunity to give them da'wah And to encourage them to make tawbah and seek forgiveness So he says I say there is no difference In whether the sick is pious or a sinner However that jannah is more expensive for the righteous And less so for the sinful right? So it's even more emphasized For the, uh, the one who is righteous to, to visit them because they have uh, because of their status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al Rabi wa Situn min Shu'ab al Iman, as Salatu ala man mata min ahl al Qibla. As Salatu ala man mata min ahl al Qibla. Praying for any deceased Muslim. Uh, he uses the term here, ahl al Qibla. Ahl al Qibla. This term is a lot more general than the term we usually hear, which is ahl al Sunnah. Ahl al Sunnah is a more specific term. The people who follow the Sunnah, right? The people who follow the Sunnah. And we have this term Ahlul Qibla, which is a little more general. It refers to anyone who, who is still within the fold of Islam, but this can include other deviant groups, right? Groups who have strayed from the Sunnah of Rasulullah, but they're still within the fold of Islam. Right? We call this uh, along with Ahlul Sunnah, anyone who's within the fold of Islam, they will call they'll call Ahlul Qibla. Ahlul Qibla. So anyone who's from Ahlul Qibla, even if they're from a, a different sect, as long as they still remain under the fold of Islam, then they have the right for you to pray over them. They have the right for you to pray over them when they die. Uh, he mentioned the hadith of, uh, in the Sahihain that Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh, narrates that the Prophet said, the Muslim must do these five things. Return greetings, visit the sick, say may Allah have mercy on you when somebody sneezes, attend funerals, and accept invitations. Very similar to uh, the hadith that we just previously covered uh, And then he mentions the reward The hadith that mentions the reward of Those who take part in the janazah Whoever takes part in janazah salah which Shall have a qirat, a qirat And whoever attends a burial Shall have two qirat Alright so uh, The qirat is like Mount Uhud In, in reward it's equal to Mount Uhud So uh, attending the janazah salah Is a very rewarding Very rewarding thing to do so whenever we hear of a janazah, we should try our best to try to make the janazah salah. Because this benefits you, right? It benefits you, you get this tremendous reward. And more importantly, it benefits the deceased. The deceased also, they need uh, du'as and they need people to pray for them at that time. And if you can go and attend the burial, then this is even better. And you get double the reward. Double the reward. Two qirat, which is like the uh, equal uh, to Mount Uhud. Equal to Mount Uhud. 
Uh, what is the ruling of Salatul Janaza? Fard Kifaya, right? Communal obligation. How do we know that it is not a individual obligation? How do we know that it is not individual obligation on everyone to do? Okay. Possible. I mean, it's, it, it can't be prayed if nobody else is there. It's meant to be in part duration, but if nobody else is there, they will offer it by themselves. It still has to be offered, right? It still has to be offered. How do we know that it's not an individual obligation? Anyone? So, Rasulullah would leave the janazah on certain people. Right? He would leave janazah on certain people, which shows that it's not obligatory. Or, or else he would have prayed a janazah on everyone. So there's certain people, due to certain sins they committed, or certain things they did, he would not pray their janazah. Anybody have an example of that? Right, the one who died and they had debt. They had debt, they didn't repay their debt. Rasulullah did not offer the janazah. But he allowed other people to pray janazah, right? So it doesn't mean that they don't have janazah. Somebody has to pray over them. But he would do that to show the seriousness of this, right? So there are certain people Rasulullah did not pray the janazah for, which shows that it is not mandatory to pray the janazah uh, individually. Individually, everyone has to pray it, but uh, one, at least some in the community must offer the janazah for anyone from Ahl Qibla who dies and they are under the fold of Islam. Al Khamis was Situn in Shu'i will Iman, Tashmi to Laatis, saying, Allah have mercy on you to the one who sneezes. And he brings the hadith in Sahih Muslim by Abu Musa al Ash'ari. When one of you sneezes, he should say, Alhamdulillah. Right? This, is all, this is common knowledge that we all know. And if one does this, then the other person should say, Allah have mercy on you. Yarhamukullah. But if he does not, then they should refrain. Right? So the condition for saying Yarhamukullah is. Dependent on the person saying Alhamdulillah. If the person did not say Alhamdulillah, then you don't, you, you are not ab- obliged to say Yarhamukullah. In fact, you should not say it. You should only say Yarhamukullah if they say it. If you can, if you hear them say it. Uh, other than that, then there is no uh, obligation to say Yarhamukullah. Only if they sneeze and they say Alhamdulillah. As-Sadis was situn min shu'ab al-Iman fi mubaadit fi mubaadit al-kufari wal musidin wal ghilza alayhim. Keeping unbelievers and those who act evilly at a distance and being stern with them. This is specifically talking about hostile, hostile disbelievers, right? Uh, the, the Islam has different rulings depending on what type of disbeliever it is. So there are some Muslims, non-Muslims, who are hostile to Islam and hostile to Muslims. And there's others who are a lot friendly on friendlier terms, right? So these verses and these hadith are talking more about those disbelievers who are hostile, hostile to the believers. Allah says, let not the believers... Uh, take disbelievers as allies rather than believers. And whoever you does that has nothing with Allah except when taking precaution against them in prudence. So generally speaking, especially when it comes to politics and warfare, warfare specifically, believers should never take disbelievers as allies. Right? It should always be believers as taken as their allies. Certain situations, there might, you might be allowed to take the disbelievers as allies, as Allah says at the end of the verse. And whoever of you does that has nothing with Allah except, with exception, when taking precaution against them in prudence. There are certain situations where a person can make an agreement with disbelievers, but they should not take them as allies uh, rather than the believers. Uh, and then brings the verse, O Prophet, fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be harsh upon them. As we said, these are referring to the hostile disbelievers. O you who believe, fight those adjacent to you of the disbelievers and let them find in you harshness. Uh, harshness so that when they see the harshness, they can refrain from their hostilities and they can take a lesson from that. All right? If a person sees that you are soft and weak, then they will be more likely to uh, continue to be aggressive against you. But if they see that you're standing up and you're not allowing them to do what they want, then they will be less likely to uh, infringe upon the Muslims. Uh, and the verse, O you who have believed, do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies, extending to them affection while they had disbelieved in what came to you of the truth, having driven out the Prophet ﷺ and yourselves only because you believe in Allah, your Lord. If you have come out for jihad in my cause and seek a means to my approval, take them not as friends, you confide in them affection. Uh, but I am most knowing of what you have concealed and what you have declared. And whoever does it among you has certainly strayed from the soundness of the way. 
This is uh, the verses, uh, verses in Surah Al-Mumtahina, or Mumtahina, uh, warning against taking the believer, uh, disbelievers, once again, as uh, allies, as taking them as allies. Uh, and this applies whether those disbelievers are family members as well. Even if they are family, Allah says in the verse mentioned after, O oh, you who have believed, do not take your fathers or your brothers as allies if they have preferred disbelief over belief. And whoever does so amongst you, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. Right? A verse like this is uh, a lot easier said than done. Right? Um, we can talk about not uh, having to, not, you know, not siding against your family. All right? It's something that's easy to talk about, but when you come to a situation where, as happened in the, in the, in the time of the Sahaba, عنهم, when they came into battle and on the other side they had their father or their brother or their uncle. Right? Even some of the Sahaba, uh, I believe it was uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas He ended up having to kill his own father in the battle right? So uh, when that situation comes up It's a lot more difficult than just talking about it When you actually see your family members on the other side On the other side And that's what the Sahaba went through They had to see their own family on the other side Fighting against them But their Iman prevailed and they held firm Uh on the topic of making sure that you, you do not uh, you keep the disbelievers at a distance especially those who are hostile and also uh, by, uh, by by me, opposite meaning you should take the believers and make them close to you and this is the meaning of the hadith that Prophet says only a, uh, only a God-fearing person should eat your food and only a believer should be your companion only a God-fearing person should eat your food and only a believer should be your companion and then he mentions an example of disassociating from disbelievers or even disassociating, disassociating for, from believers who have strayed or who have made mistakes or have made errors. This is uh, also something that's allowed in certain situations. And he brings the example of uh, the Prophet ﷺ when he boycotted those three companions for 50 days. Ka'b ibn Malik, Murara ibn Rabi' and Hilal ibn Umayyah. Right? Those who stayed behind in the battle of Tabuk. We had had a lecture on this uh, a few months ago or last year on uh, this, this topic, those who remained behind during the Battle of Tabuk. So they were boycotted for 50 days because of a mistake that they made in not preparing for the battle and not having any excuse for staying behind. All right, Sabi was situn in Shu'ab al-Iman, Ikram al jaw Honoring one's neighbors. Honoring one's neighbors. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِ الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْجَارِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْجَارِ الْجُنُبِ وَالصَّاحِبِ بِالْجَنْبِ وَبِنِ السَّبِيلِ وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ And to parents do good and to relatives as well do good and to the orphans and the needy and the near neighbor and the farther away neighbor and the companion at your side, the traveler and those whom your right hand possesses. Right, so Allah says, do good, do good to all these categories of people. And he mentions here the neighbor, two, ty- two categories of the neighbor, the near neighbor and the farther away neighbor. What is meant by the near neighbor and the far neighbor? Difference of opinion amongst the scholars, what does this mean? Some of them say that it means literally the neighbor who is close, that's the one right next to you, who lives next to you, and the far neighbor is the one who lives a bit further away. Right? That's one interpretation. Uh, another interpretation is that the near neighbor is your family. Your neighbor who is also a family member. And the far neighbor is the one who is non-family. All right? That's non-family. All right? So it doesn't have to do with distance. It's we're talk, talking about family or non-family. All right? That's another interpretation. All right? So he says here, the neighbor who is farther away refers to a neighbor whose residence is more distant. All right? That's one interpretation. And the companion at your side is the fellow traveler. All right? Another interpretation is that the near neighbor is the one who's related to you. All right? And they have more rights. They have more rights the one who is a neighbor and also a family member, then the neighbor who is farther away, meaning he's not a family member, he's not related to you. And another interpretation of companion at your side is one who is your companion, whether he's in a journey or not. Right? So one interpretation is companion at your side in a journey specifically. In a journey specifically. Another interpretation is companion, journey or not journey, not in a journey. And then we have another interpretation, companion to side, referring to one's uh, wife, one's, your, one's wife. Right, so these are a few different interpretations of what is meant by the close neighbor, the far, the far neighbor, and the companion at your side. 
Uh, and then he brings the hadith uh, that Jibreel uh, would continuously advise Rasulullah about the neighbors. Uh, right? Right? That uh, Jibreel was, would so frequently advise me to be kind to neighbors that I thought that the neighbor would get a share in inheritance. Rasulullah thought that the neighbor would get a share in inheritance. This is how frequently Jibreel used to advise him about the neighbor. So the neighbors have rights um, to good and right to good treatment, and especially that neighbor is a family member, right? If you have neighbors or family, then they deserve even more good treatment and uh, extra attention. And uh, what is neighbor? Some of the scholars have mentioned that um, neighbor can they, they mention forty houses, right? Forty houses in each direction. They, they consider that this is one uh, statement of the scholars of what is considered a neighbor: forty houses in each direction. All right, that might be a bit different in today's age because now we have uh, the high-rise buildings, right, where the, the neighbors are up to. So that can also include up as well. Allahu alam. Al-thamin was situn min shu'ab al-iman ikram al honoring the guest, honoring the guest. The narration in Sahih, Bukhari wa Muslim, whoever believes in Allah on the last day must honor his neighbor. Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, let him honor his neighbor. And whoever believes in Allah on the last day must honor his guests. Should honor his guest. Uh, as he deserves. So they asked Rasulullah what is meant by as he deserves. And he replied to be hosted for three days and three nights. Anything more is counted as a charity on your part. And whoever believes in Allah on the last day should speak kindly or remain silent. Right? This is specifically talking about those people in, in those days they would, they would travel and they didn't have hotels, right? they didn't have places where they could stay So they would depend on people to host them right? They would depend on people to host them They're traveling from uh, out of town So uh, Rasulullah said that they are to be hosted at least for one day, one night Three is the recommendation Anything after that is sadaqah After that will be sadaqah and uh, we know that the Arabs, even before Islam, they were known for their hospitality. Right? And this is something that continues in some parts of the Arab, Arab world. Right? Uh, I don't, Egypt, they have hospitality somewhat, right? Um, but definitely in some parts of the Arab world, they still continue this uh, hospitality uh, trend of being very hospitable. And this is something the Arabs were known for, to be very hospitable. And this is something that Islam continued. So the Arabs, they had some good qualities, right? Uh, Allah chose the Arabs to make them, uh, make them from amongst who the final messenger would come. They had good qualities, right? They had some evil qualities as well, but they had some very good qualities. Amongst them, that they were very hospitable. They were very hospitable people. All right, honor and guest, the 68th branch of Iman. min al Iman ala ashab al ay Covering or concealing the sins. Uh, by the way, uh, the, we have examples of the Quran of the example of honoring the guest before we go down. Uh, honoring the guest. Uh, we have an example of that in the Quran. Uh, which example of honoring the guest? Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? When the angels came and they came in the form of men, and as soon as they came, he brought Ajlin uh, Samin. He brought them a very fat uh, calf to, for them to eat. He slaughtered it and roasted it. So this is an example of honoring the guests mentioned in the Quran. min uh, al iman, the 69th branch of iman, concealing sins of others. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, indeed, those who like that immorality should be spread or publicized amongst you. Those who have believed, who have believed, will have a painful punishment in this world and the hereafter. All right. So the, whenever there is sins being committed. The, the first response should be to conceal those sins. It should not be spread because this will lead to the sins being spread amongst other people. All right, this verse was revealed, uh, was revealed concerning the incident when Aisha, radiallahu anha, the wife of Rasulullah sallam, she was slandered. Right? She was accused of adultery. And some of the companions, they took part in the spreading of this rumor. All right, they took part in the spreading of this rumor. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses in Surah An-Nur, where he criticizes those companions who took part in spreading this rumor. And he says that those who do this, they don't repent, they'll have a very painful punishment in this world 
and the hereafter. So the, the general rule is that a person should uh, promote tawbah, promote uh, forgive, seeking forgiveness, and should not expose people's sins. Of course, there are uh, there are exceptions, right? There are exceptions. If a person is doing something where the community needs to be warned, then this is an exception. In that case, uh, those that person they're not they don't deserve for their sin to be concealed. Right? Somebody is cheating the Muslims. Somebody is uh, stealing people's money, stealing people's wealth, cheating people in business. Then not only it is allowed to expose that person, but it might be even mandatory to expose that person so that the rest of the Muslims are not harmed. Right? So uh, if a person is committing a sin where they are harming other Muslims, then situations like that, they can be warned against and they can be exposed. But for those believers who are committing sins and it doesn't have to do anybody else, between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then their sh sins should be concealed. Their sins should be concealed and it should not be spread. Uh, then we have the hadith in the Sahihain that uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu narrates. Rasulullah said, A Muslim is a Muslim's brother. He does not wrong or betray him. Whoever aids his brother will be aided by Allah. Whoever re relieves a believer of a trial will be re relieved by Allah of one of the trials of the day of resurrection. And then he brings the uh, point of this mentioned in this hadith, which is, and whoever conceals the fault of a Muslim will have Allah conceal his faults on the day of resurrection. Right? And this is one of the other reasons why you conceal a Muslim's faults is because everybody else has faults as well. So if you want Allah to conceal your faults, then you conceal your fellow Muslim brother or sister's faults. As-sab'oon shu'ab al-iman as ala al-masa'ib. Patience when it comes to calamities, steadfastness in the face of misfortunes, and against the desires and delights of the ego. Allah says in the Quran, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ Right, uh, and uh, seek help through patience and prayer. Uh, it is difficult indeed, or this verse, وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ It is difficult except for the humble, humbly submissive uh, to Allah. Uh, steadfast is here. Some of the scholars say that it refers to fasting. The patience refers to fasting. All right, some of the scholars have mentioned this. That patience. وَاسْتَعِينُ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ Seek help in patience. Specifically, fasting and prayer. And then Allah says that it is difficult. The prayer, referring to the prayer, it is difficult. إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِرِينَ It is difficult except for those who are humbly submissive to Allah. And then we have some well-known verses. We've heard these verses many times. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقُصِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ And we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth, lives and fruits, but give glad tidings to the patient. Those who, when a disaster strikes them, they say, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Indeed, we do. We belong to Allah, and indeed, to Him we will return. We uh, are used to saying this phrase when somebody dies, right? When somebody dies. And this is good. But we should also use this phrase for the other things mentioned in the verse. Allah says, we will test you with something of fear or hunger. Right? You can also say this phrase, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ When there's testing of hunger. People are going hungry. You can say this phrase as well. Loss of wealth. Somebody's house burned down. We can say this as well. Or we should say this. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ all right, um, loss of fruits, there's a drought, uh, there's no rain coming, there's no fruits. We can say this as well. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. Right, so don't just limit this phrase to when somebody dies. We can say this phrase, whatever is mentioned in the verse. Any type of calamity, you say this uh, phrase, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. All right, and it's not just for when somebody dies. Although, of course, this is one of the uh, primary ways in which this phrase is used. Uh, those are upon those ulaika alayhim salawatun min rabbihim wa rahmah those are uh, uh, the ones upon whom are blessings from their lord and mercy and they are the guiding ones uh, and then in the in the verse uh, indeed inna yuwaffa as-sabirun ajrahum bighayri hisab indeed the patient will be given their reward without account there is no limit to the amount of rewards for patience patience has no limits in terms of how much reward you can get. And this is why the scholars mention that when Allah says, that fasting is for me, 
and I will reward it as I wish. The scholars have mentioned that fasting, the reward of fasting is unlimited. Why? Because fasting is patience. Fasting is all about patience. So patience, Allah says about this uh, patience in, in this verse, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ The patient, people, people of patience, will be given the reward without account. Right? No account. Meaning unlimited rewards for patience. And this is why the fasting person has unlimited rewards because fasting is all about patience. Hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri that a group of Ansar, they came to Rasulullah asking for gifts. And he gave all what he had. And they kept on asking. All right, so Rasulullah he had a bunch of gifts. And he distributed everything that he had. He had nothing else left. And they kept on asking him. And there was nothing left. And when, any, when, uh, when everything had been given to them, he said, whenever, he said to them, sorry, he said to them, whenever I come into possession of something good, I will not keep it from you. I'm not going to be stingy. Whatever I have, I'm going to give. But whoever is abstinent shall be helped in this by Allah. And whoever tries to have no need, Allah will make him have no needs. And whoever tries to be steadfast, Allah will make him steadfast. And no one is given a gift which is better and more comprehensive than steadfastness, patience. There's no gift better than patience. So the, he was, this is a learning lesson for the Sahaba. They were you know, uh, very excited about getting the gifts. But Rasulullah told them that the best gift I can give you is teaching you patience. This is the best gift that you can be given. Uh, no one has been given anything better and more comprehensive than steadfastness, meaning patience. Uh, and then he mentions the the uh, the hadith on when the Rasulullah was sick, when he was very sick. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he went to the Prophet when he was very sick. And he said, you have been afflicted with the sicknesses of two men. So when Rasulullah used to get sick, it was the sickness of two men. And then he said, that is because you, uh, you are who have a, a two-fold reward. Right? So he, he also mentioned that you will have double reward. Uh, and then Rasulullah said, yes, he confirmed what he, he said, that yes, that the sickness I have is equal to two people, and it is because it will, I will, uh, the reward will be even higher. And then Rasulullah says that whoever, whenever a Muslim is afflicted by an illness or anything else, Allah strikes out some of his sins just as a tree sheds its leaves. All right, another hadith mentions even the prick of a thorn. Even the prick of a thorn, Allah sheds sins because of any type of affliction, even if it's something as small as a prick of a thorn. So uh, Rasulullah used to, he used to be afflicted very severely when he would be sick. And this is a type of trial and test. And this shows that not every uh, test is a punishment. Right? Because obviously Rasulullah is not being punished for any sins. He didn't commit any sins to be punished. So when he was being tested with uh, sickness, and sickness equal to do two people, this was for him to increase in his status and increase in rewards. Right? So not all uh, tests are punishments. Some tests are for Allah to raise a person's rank and increase them in reward and to forgive them of their sins. So not all tests are punishment. Right? Some people have this idea that if you're afflicted with something, that means this is a punishment from Allah. And we should not uh, jump to conclusions like that. All right? Sometimes you can be tested because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you and He wants to raise your rank even more. And this is the case of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Hadi wa sab'oon min shu'ab al-Iman al-Zuhd wa qasr al-Amal Renunciation and curtailing worldly ambitions uh, They translate this as uh, How do we translate Zuhd? Abstinence, right? Huh? Asceticism, right? Asceticism And this basically means that uh, We had discussed this concept earlier, right? Of Zuhd It doesn't mean that you can't have the dunya But it means that if you have the dunya or you don't have the dunya, it's the same for you. You're not affected. Right? So it doesn't mean that you can't have the good of this life. But what it means is that if you're a person who is zud, it means that if you have the dunya or you don't have the dunya, it doesn't change who you are. There's some people when they have the dunya and they have the cars and the, 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 the big house, it changes them. And if this would be taken away, then they would be a different person. And they would lose their closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they would, uh, they would stop worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that he deserves to be worshipped. But a, a true zahid is a person who 
if these things are taken away, even if he has it, but if it's taken away, he doesn't change any bit. Right? In fact, he might even increase in his uh, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the true meaning of zuhd. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, live like a hermit in a cave, not having anything, depriving yourself of any, uh, anything good in this life. You can have the good of this life with the condition that if you don't have it, if it's taken away, you're the same person and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the same. And this is difficult for many people, which is why many of the Sahaba, they prefer to remain poor and they prefer to live a, a life of, uh, of uh, having very little material benefits because of the fact that this is a means of people becoming arrogant. Right? And, and losing the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you are able to do that, then there's no harm in a person having and enjoying what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, given lawfully for uh, believers in this life. Uh, then he, he mentions the hadith, I have been sent when the hour is like this. And he pointed with his forefinger and his middle finger, showing how close. So, he, so we're supposed to be saying that I've been sent when the hour is like this, meaning when I have been sent and when the hour is, it's like, like this, very close, very close. Uh, can somebody tell us what this is, hadith have to do about zuhd and controlling worldly ambitions? What's the point of mentioning this hadith that the hour is very near? What's the connection here? Exactly, very good. Right? If we're only here for a limited amount of time, why are you going to overindulge in the dunya when it's only a short amount of time, very short amount of time? Right? Why would you put all your effort, all your eggs into one basket of the dunya and it's only going to be ending, it's going to be ending very soon and then you have the akhirah which is forever. Right? So he mentioned this hadith to show that the dunya is very short, very short and the hour is going to be established very soon from now. So there is very little benefit in overindulging in the worldly ambitions. Uh, and then he mentions the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. There are two blessings in which many people are cheated. Many people lose these blessings. Health and idle time. Health and idle time. Right, a lot of people, they delay, delay doing good deeds and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until they get old. And then they're not able to worship him in the way that they wanted to. Right? So you have the time or you have the strength to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't wait until you have poor health where you can no longer stand to pray. Right? You have to pray sitting. Or when you are busy with work or you're busy with children and you're busy with other uh, obligations and you have no time to do what you uh, had intended to do when you were, uh, had the free time and health. So these are two things that many people are, are missing, miss out on. All right, moving on to الثاني والسبعون من شعب الإيمان الغيرة or it can be pronounced as الغيرة both are, are correct وترك المذاء أو, أو المذاء لقوله تعالى قو أنفسكم أهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة وقل المؤمنات يغضضن من أبصارهن ويحفظن فروجهن this, uh, this is uh, concerning uh, a person having غيرة or غيرة which is jealousy that a person will feel for his wife all right, this is a branch of Iman, and this is of course something that is not present in today's society. Right? In today's society, uh, people compete with who can uh, show off their wife the most. Right? This is completely opposite of what Islam wants from us, which is a person should have jealousy. They should not want their wife to be seen by anybody. They should not want their wife to be looked at by anybody. This is the concept of ghayra or ghira for one's family, specifically their wife. And not engaging in uh, what they call al-mida, which is flirting. Allah says in the Quran, "Protect yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is people and stones." And a verse, and tell the believing women to reduce some of their vision and guard their private parts. I right, to cover themselves up and guard their uh, guard their private parts. Uh, and then he brings the hadith: Allah is concerned for uh, his. Uh, persevere as, as is the believer. Allah's concern is that the believer should not approach the forbidden. Uh, then we have another hadith about uh, hermaphrodite. This is a person who, so th th this word, uh, the Arabic word is mukhannath, right? Mukhannath. 
And it can either refer to a person who has both male and female organs, or it can refer to a person who has feminine qualities. Feminine qualities. And this, this is what's meant in this hadith. A person has feminine qualities. There's some people, they're naturally like this. That they're, 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 they're male, but they have a very uh, feminine voice. Right? They're naturally like that. Right? Or they naturally behave like women. Right? This is how they, are, they naturally are. Not, not, not something that they are intending to do. So this person is called a Mukhannaf. And there was one of these people in the house uh, of Umm Salama. All right? And this uh, Mukhannaf, uh, he said to Abdullah ibn Umayyah, the brother of Umm Salama, Abdullah, if Allah allows you to conquer Ta'if tomorrow, I shall take you to the daughter of Ghayalan, who has four rows of fat in front and eight behind. He's basically describing uh, the woman, right? And describing her in very uh, graphic details. And Rasulullah said to, to, to them afterwards, these people should not visit you. These people should not visit you. Um, because before that, prior to that, they used to think that this person, this, he's a man, right? But he's feminine. So there's no harm in them mixing with the women. But then once they saw that these effeminate men, they end up uh, having foul speech and talking inappropriately, then Rasulullah said, don't let them mix with the women. They should not mix with the women. Even if there are... Be, even if their, their behavior is like women They should still not mix with the women right? Because then they end up Saying and talking inappropriate things uh, And then the last hadith Of this uh, branch Ghira is from faith and flirtation is from hypocrisy Turning away from idle speech Pointless talk Allah says about the believers uh, Certainly Will the believers have succeeded? And the very next thing mentioned after making sure that they are humbly submissive in their salah, very next thing mentioned, and they turn away from evil speech. And they turn away from evil or pointless speech. Uh, and in another verse, Allah says, And they are those who do not testify to falsehood. Uh, when they pass air speech, Right? When they pass by uh, Ill, Ill speech or pointless speech Then they pass it with dignity When they hear ill speech they turn away from it So this is any type of Futile and irrelevant speech right? Anything that has no benefit If it doesn't benefit in the dunya And it doesn't benefit in the akhirah Then it is lagu It is lagu, pointless and uh, Ill speech and the believer Should avoid that the Believer should avoid that because with the lagu will eventually lead to haram, right? If you constantly engage in pointless speech, then eventually it's going to lead to uh, engaging in haram speech. This is how the shaitan leads people on, right? He starts by first getting, getting them to indulge in pointless speech, and then it moves on and on until they start talking uh, in, uh, with haram. Right? So it has no benefit in this life or the next life, and it may bring misfortune instead. Uh, and then hadith, it is part of a man's sound practice of Islam that he leaves alone that which does not concern him. That which does not concern him. Al-Rabi'u al-Sab'un min shu'ab al-Iman al-Jood wa Generosity and benevolence. Generosity and benevolence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْجُهَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعِدَّتْ المتقين الذين ينفقون في السراء والضراء those who spend during ease and hardship and those who are stingy and uh, in another verse who are stingy and enjoyed upon other people's stinginess and conceal what Allah has given of them uh, of his bounty and we prepared for the disbelievers a humiliating punishment so this is the opposite the verse is the opposite first verse is an encouragement to be uh, generous the second verse is a warning about being stingy and enjoining other people to be stingy. You know, there's some people, Allah says, look at this verse, Allah says, those who are stingy and enjoin other people stinginess. Right? There's some people that are stingy, but you know, they don't hinder other people from being stingy as, as well. But then there's some people, they're stingy, and they hinder people, and they make other people stingy. So they don't want to give, and then if you give, they might tell you, you know, why are you giving so much money for? Or why are you wasting your money on this, this project or that project or this and they actively try to discourage people from spending. So these people, Allah has says, He's prepared for them a humiliating punishment. All right. So if you're if you're going to be stingy, right, that's on you. It's between you and Allah, right? But don't discourage other people from spending. 
right, uh, and become stingy like, if you are stingy, don't make others stingy like you. Uh, and then hadith uh, in Sahihain, Abu Hurairah narrates that the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ says, Every morning two angels descend. One of them says, O oh Lord, bless the poster, uh, posterity of who, him who spends. And the other says, O oh Lord, oh, uh, Lord Allah, destroy him who withholds. Right? Every single morning. Every single morning, the angel makes dua. Either for you or against you. Right? The one who spends, the angel makes dua for you. If a person withholds and is stingy, then the angel makes dua against you. And of course, we know that the month of Ramadan is coming up, and this is the month of generosity. And Rasulullah was even more generous. Can Rasulullah nas? He was the most generous of people. fi Ramadan. He was even more generous in the month of Ramadan. He when he would meet with Jibril and they used to revise the Quran together, and he would be even more generous in the month of Ramadan. So this is a hadith to. Uh, bear in mind as we come upon the uh, month of Ramadan to increase in generosity, increase in spending. And we have so many opportunities today, all right, when it comes to spending. All right, uh, as we know, there's so many campaigns, there's so many organizations, so many masajid, so many different countries of people who are suffering. There is no shortage of opportunities to spend. All right, in fact, there is more than we can handle. All right, there's so many. Every every day you look, you see there's a, a campaign, a uh, a GoFundMe or something like that of, of people who need our need. All right, so there's no shortage of opportunities to spend. Uh, but of course, a person is to look uh, at whatever is the most beneficial and most uh, where they can have the most impact and give fi sabilillah. Al khamis wa sabiun min shu'ab al iman, rahim al saghir wa tawqir al kabir. To have mercy for the young and respect the old. Have mercy for the young and respect the old. And he brings the hadith, Allah will not have mercy for him who does not have mercy for others. Allah will not have mercy for him who does not have mercy for others. If you want Allah's mercy, then you need to show mercy as well. You cannot expect Allah to shower his mercy on you, and you are a, a person who shows no mercy to others. And it's narrated in the Sahihain that Abu Hurairah narrates that the Prophet said, Allah has divided mercy into 100 parts. All right? Allah's mercy is divided into 100 parts. 99 he has withheld for the akhirah. Allah's mercy is 100 parts. 99 has been reserved for the akhirah. And that one part of mercy, Allah has descended it on the earth. And whenever his creatures show mercy to one another, it is through this one part. Even when a mare is fearful of treading on her foal. Right, this type of animal. Um, careful not to trample upon its, uh, its baby. This type of mercy that the animal shows to the other animal, this is all part of the one part of mercy that Allah has descended on earth and the rest of the mercy, the, the, the other 99 parts have been reserved for the next life. Or reserved for the next life. So if this is the mercy that Allah has descended and this is a lot of mercy already. Imagine what Allah has in store for the believers on the day of judgment. Uh, and then the hadith, whoever does not show mercy to our young and does not know the rights of our elders is not one of us. Now we've mentioned these type of hadith before is not one of us meaning they are not uh, a good Muslim they, they have not uh, developed strong iman it doesn't mean that they're not a Muslim anymore they're still a Muslim however their iman is deficient their iman is deficient if you do not show mercy to our young and do not know the rights of the elders in any community these two ingredients are necessary for any community to be successful right the the, the elders need to be merciful to the young and the young need to be respectful to the elders. If one of these things is missing, then that community is going to be a failure. And if you look at many of the failures in the communities, you can usually look and find one of these two things is missing. Right? Either the, the elders are not giving the attention to the, young, the younger uh, uh, members of the community, or the younger members are not respecting the elders and they are not uh, giving them their rights. So these two things are very important for any successful community. Uh, and in the hadith, Rasulullah says, give priority to the most senior. Meaning, uh, if you're coming in a group, this the hadith was mentioned when a group of people were coming, and a younger member of the group wanted to speak. And so Rasulullah said, kabir al-kabir. Let the, let the older one come. Let the one who's older come and speak. Let him be the spokesperson. So if there's ever a group of people 
the spokesperson should be the elder one. The elder one should be the spokesperson, unless he has um, the, the younger one has some kind of uh, ha has some kind of qualities that make him deserving of speaking. Then he can go forward. Otherwise, the general uh, default is that the elder should be speaking. And this relates to speaking. This also re re relates to things like leading the salah. As it comes in the hadith, your imam should be the most senior amongst you. This hadith is assuming the other conditions are met, all right? which is uh, there, there is a, a line of conditions when it comes to leading the salah. First and foremost, having knowledge of the religion, uh, fiqh, the religion of fiqh of salah, and then knowledge of the Quran, recitation of the Quran. If these things are equal, if they're equal in knowledge, if they're equal in recitation of the Quran, then something like this will apply, which is the elder of the two will lead. Right? But uh, this doesn't mean that the elder automatically leads. This is assuming that they are equal in knowledge and they're equal in recitation of the Quran. If, they, if they're equal in all of that, then the elder amongst the, of them uh, should lead. As-sadis wa sab'oon min shu'ab al-iman islah wa dhat al-bayn Reconciling people's differences. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, no good is there in much of their private conversation except for those who enjoy charity or that which is right or consolation between people. And whoever does that, seeking means to appro the approval of Allah, then we are going to give them or give him a great reward. And the verse in the Mu'minun Ikhwa, the believers are but brothers. And so make settlement between your brothers. And this uh, issue of settling between your brothers and making uh, con re reconciliation, it's so important to the point where uh, Rasulullah has allowed lying in a situation where if that lie is going to bring people together. And this is what's mentioned in the next hadith. He is not a liar who makes peace between people, saying what is good and not mentioning what is dishonorable. All right? So there are certain situations where even lying is acceptable. If, in one of these situations, if this will bring people together, right? And what is meant by lying here is like uh, people are, uh, have a dispute and you go and you tell a person, he didn't mean it like that, right? He didn't really mean to say those things, right? He, he loves you and so on and so forth, exaggerating a bit. Uh, and this is allowed if it's going to lead to reconciliation. And uh, with regards to lying in general, the, the next hadith mentions, uh, I have never heard him uh, re meeting Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Permitting any kind of lying except with regard to three things. War, reconciling, reconciling people's differences, and what a man says to his wife and what a wife says to her husband. And these are situations in which lying is allowed. And some of the scholars have said here what's meant is not the pure lies. Pure lies. What's actually meant is something called tawriya, which is where you, you say something that has double meaning. Right? You say something that has double meaning. It can be taken one way, but you really intend it the other way. Right? Like uh, for example, uh, when Rasulullah they were uh, in the, the hijrah with Abu Bakr and they were approached by somebody who asked them, you know, who is this man with you? And Abu Bakr said, he is my guide. He's guiding me to the path. And what he really meant was his guide, his spiritual guide. Right? Not that Rasulullah was his guide on the actual road. He meant spiritual guide. But this statement could have been taken either way. Right? So it's not an actual full pure lie. Uh, but what he said, the, other, the, the, the person understood the opposite of what he intended. All right, so some of the scholars have mentioned that when they say lying here, it's not the pure lie, but it is a lie that can be taken two ways. You intend one thing, but what they hear is something else. Allahu uh, But the point of mentioning is this, is that uh, reconciling, reconciling between people is so important that even if, it, if, it, if it, 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 it's necessary to lie or exaggerate, for people to come back together and reconcile, then this is something that is allowed. All right, and we come to the final branch of Iman. This comes back to uh, the to love for your Muslim brother what you love for yourself and to hate for him what you hate for yourself. And this also includes removing something harmful from the road. This is what we mentioned in the very beginning. Anybody remember the hadith? The first hadith we mentioned 
about the, uh, the branches of Iman. Al Imanu bid'un wa sattun shu'ba, aw bid'un wa sab'un shu'ba, a'alaha la ilaha illallah, wa adnaha imatutul adha an at tariq, wal hayau shu'ba tu min al Iman. Right? That hadith, the very first hadith we mentioned, we said that this is the most important hadith of this class. Uh, that Iman is either 60 or 70 odd branches. The highest is saying La ilaha illallah. The lowest is removing something harmful from the road. And uh, modesty is a branch of faith. Modesty is a branch of faith. Uh, so loving for your Muslim brother, what you love for yourself. This is a hadith as well. La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. None of you have Iman until he wishes for his brother that which he wishes for himself. And we understand from this hadith as well what we call mafhum al mukhalifa which is the opposite understanding of the hadith. Which is, you love for your brother what you love for yourself. We can also der derive from this hadith, you hate for your brother what you hate for yourself. All right? Just as you, you love for your brother what you love for yourself, you should also hate for your brother what you hate for yourself. And we end with the hadith of Jarir ibn Abdullah who says that I pledged my allegiance to Rasulullah with the undertaking that I would observe salah, and would pay zakah, and have good will to every Muslim. Have good will to every Muslim. Uh, and we end with that. Tam al-kitab, alhamdulillah, awalan wa akhiran. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam, mubarak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We have finished the book. Uh, alhamdulillah. And uh, we'll take some questions now, inshallah. And we have some refreshments at the end. This will be our last session for uh, the branches of Iman. Inshallah, after Ramadan, we will continue our Friday night uh, classes with a different topic. Most likely, it would be a topic on fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence. We will, uh, that will be the topic of the next class, inshallah. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, grant us beneficial knowledge to allow us to benefit what we have uh, heard uh, in these sessions and make it a proof for us, not against us. Allahumma ameen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, so the question is about the runaway slave and the and the prohibition of running away. Would that apply to the slaves in America? No, because it's a different system altogether, right? The, the, what Rasulullah is talking about, he's already he's already reformed the system, as we mentioned in that hadith where the slave eats from what the same food that the master is eating, that he's clothed with the same clothing, he lives in the same uh, living arrangements, right? This is not was not present in that other form of, of, of slavery. And so that's a, a different situation, right? This is assuming that when, when, when the prohibition of running away is because there's no need for them to run away, they can come to the authority and they can have their uh, complaints addressed. There's no, they can come to Rasulullah So this is encouraging a system, to have a system. If a slave was mistreated, they can come to Rasulullah and he will settle it. And so there's no need to run away. In that system, there's oppression. Who are they going to go to? Right, where it is already built in that this is, they're already oppressed by the highest level of authority. So there's no authority they can go to that would uh, remove this injustice and oppression from them. So it's a, it's a totally different situation. Yeah, um, the translator, possibly. Um, the the translator, I, I think I read at the beginning, uh, this was produced in like, uh, or he's from Australia. So sometimes they also have different English as well, right? Different wor English words, uh, because he's from Australia or, uh, or some other part. So it, it's possible that for, for that reason as well. I don't know. All right, any other questions? Yes. Yes. Are there other units of reward? Are there examples? This is a, a specific unit. 
special to janaza. All right, so it's not going to apply to anything else. This is like a specific measuring system, just for janaza. So the question is, are there any other? So the janaza. I'm just repeating the question, right? So there's a reward for janaza, which is a qirat, which is equal to Mount Uhud in a reward, and there's qirathan if you attend the burial as well. Is there another scale of rewards for other deeds? That's the question. So that would that would go back to the normal scale, which is والحسنة بعشر أمثالها. Every hasana has ten rewards, equal to ten. Ten rewards until seven hundred. إلى سبع مئة ضعفين. Right. So that's the normal scale. This uh, what's mentioned here in the janaza is specific to janaza, but other in general good deeds. Each good good deed you do is equal to ten, and it can go all the way up to seven hundred. That's the normal scale. Um, I'm not sure. Allah. Um, So the question is, he, he mentions about when you visit the sick, you can either, you, whether that person is sinful or righteous, they should both be visited. But then he says that the righteous will have even a bigger garden. All right? How does he know that? Uh, this is most likely his personal interpretation. All right? Based on uh, looking into the sunnah of Rasulullah and who Rasulullah would visit. All right? who, who we have examples of him visiting other Sahaba when they would get sick. All right, and the, all the examples that I can think of are righteous companions. All right, we don't necessarily have examples of uh, him visiting uh, somebody who didn't, who was a drunkard. Right? There are some, certain companions who might have been drunkards all right? or other you know, sins. So maybe this is his personal interpretation, lo looking at uh, the examples of Rasulullah visiting the sick amongst uh, the, the companions. Allahu Akbar. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Okay, um, sometimes when they have discussions with people and they may say, they may say things that you may feel they may think they're minor for us. Like, let's say like someone will say, I believe in the Quran, but Muhammad, peace be upon him, I, I don't know about him, you know, but he has to have a Muslim name or, you know, whatever. Is it, I mean, do you have to say Janazah over that? Ahlul Qibla, yes. But, but like, the general public may not know that that was their belief, but you had a relationship with them. You had to spoke with them. You know. All right, so the question is, is somebody who said statements of disbelief, right? They, they said statements of disbelief. Yeah, but like, the public probably wouldn't know. The public wouldn't know. Perhaps your family members know. Um, right, so it would depend on... So that person will utter those words, all right? In order for us to declare somebody a disbeliever, this is, this is not something light. It's a very heavy matter. And there's certain conditions that need to be fulfilled, all right? Even if somebody says something, we have to make sure that they know what they're saying, all right? They know what they're saying, that they're not ignorant, that they were told, they were advised, and they still maintain it, then possibly, all right? But somebody, sometimes people say things that they don't, they don't realize what they're saying, all right? But if a person, the utter words of disbelief, which is clearly indicate that they are no longer a Muslim, and you know that, then you wouldn't pray for that person or that person if, if it's clear that they are no longer a Muslim, that they've verbally uh, indicated that they don't believe in, in an integral part of faith, then they're, not a, they're no longer a Muslim. Right? There's, there's kufr by uh, belief, and there's also kufr by act, uh, words. Right? If somebody says words, and you, well, you know that they fulfill the condition, meaning that they have uttered those words intentionally, knowing what it means, right? And they are not ignorant. Then, uh, once that has been verified, then that person, you know, they're no longer a Muslim. But um, 
Um, I, difficult for me to answer that question because um, it, it would require uh, informing everybody you need, you need to publicize that person um, whether they wanted that to be publicized or not, right? Did, did they think they're Muslim? Right. It would really depend on the situation, uh, what type of, you know, the person it is. But in general, I mean, uh, we're not allowed to pray for disbelievers, right? So if a person is a clear disbeliever, then they really should not be prayed over. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't ever pray for anyone who dies in disbelief. So if there's a clear disbeliever, they should not be prayed over, right? If there's a clear disbeliever. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. Um, this is close to the end. And she says, I never bore him for making any kind of lying except with regard to two things war, reconciling people's differences, and what a man says to his wife, and what a wife says to her husband. Mm. Could you elaborate more on that point? The last point? Yes. Okay. So. Yeah, so the, the, part, the part about uh, permissible lying, the types of permissible lying, and the last one mentioning what a man says to his wife and what a wife says to her husband. These are things that uh, a, a man might say to his wife so he doesn't upset her, right? She, maybe she cooks some, a, a meal and it doesn't taste as good as, you know, you would expect. And she asks you how it tastes. You don't, you don't go and say, you know, it's terrible. You say, you know, it tastes good, right? This is allowed. Or, and the same thing for the, the husband, right? He might ask his wife, how, you know, how does he look? Um, how, how does my haircut look or something? And she says, you know, you look nice. All right, something like that to keep the, to keep the, the love between them. All right, sometimes if you, you, you're not careful with your word, you can, that can lead to uh, marital conflict. All right, so this is what's referred to. And as we mentioned, uh, this, some of the scholars say that the lying here is not necessarily explicit lying, but the lying that, you know, is uh, it has, it can have multiple meanings, all right, but not the pure lies. This is one opinion, opinion of the scholars, and other scholars say that even the pure lies. Allah Alam. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, okay, yes, so this is branch number uh, <clears throat> 76, right? Yeah. So w which one was it? Um, the which one was that? The first one? So there's Sadaqa, Ma'roof, Islah. Those who The second one, okay. So the second one is إِلَا مَنْ أَمْرُ بِصَدَقَةٍ أَوْ مَعْرُوفٍ Ma'roof is a very general term. Right? It can mean anything good. Anything good. Anything, anything good. Any good. So it's a very general term. So it, uh, the translation is, it, it is open to multiple terms. Yeah. Alright, so we'll wrap up with that, inshallah. Subhanahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.